Today, we have uh, none other than the amazing conductor, uh, Dane Lamb. Now, uh, Dane, I, I wanted to firstly welcome you to the show. And, uh, and I wanted to, to give you a bit of a, a background for uh, how it is that I came to, to see you at the, uh, the, the conducting the Queensland Symphony Orchestra and then uh, why I really wanted to have you on the show, you know, because my wife and I have recently decided that it would be very important and uh, very important for us to take in the culture that we have available to us in this country seeing as we're so fortunate to be living so close to a, a big city that has these sorts of events on um, and seeing as I am just completely ignorant to the, uh, the depth of, um, uh, you know, the wealth of wisdom that exists within our culture, you know, that has been handed down to us from the generations past. I thought it's time, you know, especially as somebody, we both have music degrees um, and I never really, you know, I never really thought about the symphony. It was it, classical music was never a thing that I was really interested in. But, you know, I, I started listening to more of it. We started going to the symphony and yours was actually the, uh, the first symphony performance that I have ever been to um, really as you were conducting. And, uh, and man, I, I had to say that um, it, when, when we were down there, I, I, we just, we so enjoyed the show. It was such an incredible experience. And I have to say that you stole the show for me because I was watching the whole thing going on and I was thinking that conductor looks like he's the person who is having the most fun in this room right now. It just looked like you were just having the time of your life and, and you know, the, the skill that you would have to have to put on such an incredible performance as you did um, and to, to, to conduct in that way. I just said, I have to get this guy on the show. I have to dive in deep into, um, you know, your life and, and why, why you got into conducting and what it means to you. And uh, that's why we're here today. So I'm, I'm excited to have you on. Thanks so much for coming, Dane Lynn. Thanks for having me, Simon. I'm looking forward to having a chat about it all. I'm, I'm glad that, that that was your first symphony orchestra experience with the QSO. It was a, it was a special concert. Oh, it was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Just amazing. And, you know, I think I've, I've thought about the structure of the symphony before, and I've thought about um, how, how symbolic it is of so many aspects of our culture. And even as a, you know, I use the analogy with my clients who I coach often that the symphony orchestra is, is almost a picture of how we want our lives to look like, right? There's layers upon layers of virtue built on top of each other to create this incredible harmony um, which just, uh, you know, uh, is, is beautiful and stunning. But I want to hear from you. Take me right back to, you know, why did you get into conducting? Because it's such a strange profession, especially today, right? And, and you don't come across many people who <laughs> tell you that um, they're conductors. How did it come across for you? Um, and, and where did it all begin? Yeah, it's a, it's, it isn't a very common profession. Almost everybody I meet from taxi drivers to optometrists or whatever, and I say I'm a conductor, they say they've never met a conductor before, which mm. is true. There are not too many conductors, but relative to the number of orchestras and uh, opportunities, there are probably too many conductors. Mm. Yeah. Uh, getting work is not always easy, so I feel very lucky to be able to, to be back home mm. and working. Um, so I started off in, in a family that appreciated music, no professional mm. musicians or anything like that. But both my mother and my grandmother played piano. I started off learning piano from the age yeah. of six. And I went through, was fortunate to go to an excellent state high school in, in Brisbane, Mansfield High School, who, who had and still has a fantastic music program. And that's when I realised that it could become a profession. And just towards the end of my schooling, Symphony Australia, uh, now called Symphony Services International, and it was the body that administered and provided services to all the professional orchestras in Australia, together with um, the Australia Council, which is the funding body for all the arts in Australia, then the federal funding body, had decided that they needed to create a new generation of Australian conductors. Hmm. Australian conductors who could be at home, who were trained and born, in Australia, but who could conduct any of our symphony orchestras and also orchestras and opera companies around the world. So they made a very significant financial investment in that, in the form of this conducted development program where 
selected conductors worked with the various symphony orchestras under the guidance of their chief conductors and their visiting conductors. And uh, so in my last year of school, through some, a fortuitous series of events, I was able to apply for that. And that was really the kickstart. I was able to work with some amazingly experienced conductors and conducting pedagogues and um, all, all of the Australian orchestras. And it led to this assistantship and apprenticeship with Gianluigi Gelmetti, who at the time was the chief conductor of the Sydney Symphony and the Rome Opera. And so I studied with him in Sydney, Melbourne, and also in Siena in his, his, his uh, summer academy wow. in beautiful Siena. I have so many mm. wonderful Italian memories there. And it's not all the music. Mm. Uh, and yeah, so that's how it all started. Then I went to New York, studied at Juilliard, made my way over to the UK, picked up a Chinese orchestra and was sort of based between the UK and China up until last year when everything changed. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, and how has that been for you since COVID came along? Like, uh, how, how did you kind of, were there any opportunities for you to, like, were you overseas at the time and then you came back here and that's, you know, why you're now working back in, in Australia or, you know, how did you kind of manage that whole, that Yeah, transfer? well, I, I was hearing whispers of, of this virus that, that had emerged in Wuhan pretty early on, actually, because because I'm also the chief conductor of the Xi'an Symphony Orchestra in China. Mm. That was among the first work to be cancelled right early in 2020, before I think, you know, Western orchestras and Western arts organisations had really thought that, that, that the proverbial was going to hit the fan. Uh, so that was pretty early on. And in fact, the last gig I did before the pandemic hit was in Sydney with Opera Australia, um, mm. conducting Don Giovanni for them. And I was heading back to London, where my wife and I were based, uh, ready to start work in mm. the UK again. And that was in March. And then almost instantaneously, without any warning, everything closed down. But then we weren't sure really what was going to happen because we thought, oh, it was going to be a few weeks, four weeks or something like that. I think everybody thought that at first and we were all she's a singer so my wife is a singer a soprano mm -hmm. and we were both holding out for contracts in the northern summer and beyond so we stayed in our little uh, little flat in east london uh paying london rent but not earning any london fees yeah uh, and it just got to the point uh where you know we got into a routine in lockdown for three months or however long it was, getting up, going for a walk, having a coffee, cooking a lot, but not sourdough. Mm. And, <laughs> um, and then I was chatting to my Australian agent one day and he said, mate, it's great back here, things are good. And so my wife, who's not Australian, she's American, we had to have a serious conversation about what we we're gonna do. And so we came back last June, uh, just on the off chance, at least we could be with family, not paying London rent. And it was a fantastic decision because I've been very privileged to be able to work with our incredible orchestras and musicians and, and to reopen orchestral music in the country and really reopen orchestral music in the world because Australia's, mm. Australia is really at the forefront of, of, of controlling this pandemic, having a reasonably normal existence and having, and having live performance, which so yeah. many friends, colleagues around the world don't have. Yeah, yeah, we are unbelievably fortunate over here, and uh, and I was I was amazed to see that. Yeah, you were kind of um, on the forefront, as you say, of of opening up all of these orchestras again. Talk to me about all of the orchestras that you've worked with in just the past few months. You know, to to reopen in Australia. Yeah, well, it was it was even unexpected for me, but I, I I loved the opportunity to to return to some of these orchestras to reconnect with some of them. So uh, it was in August last year, fairly early on, that I conducted um, the Adelaide Symphony, with whom with whom I have a, a good relationship, um, and that was actually the very first orchestral concert in Australia since the pandemic hit for a paying audience. Mm -hmm. Then did the same thing in Queensland and QSO and I go way back. I used to watch them, obviously, when I was 
a young boy and mm. and I grew up watching this orchestra. So it's been great to be have, having a lot to do with them in recent in recent years. And then yeah. it was Opera Queensland, sort of my home company, I suppose. We opened up in QPAC. And then uh, this year it was Mel the, the Melbourne Symphony in the, the Maya Music Bowl, which was really significant for the city, I think, because they'd had such a tough time last year. Mm. And to do the first big full-scale symphonic concerts there was, was an amazing experience. And I hadn't conducted <laughs> the MSO for 13 years or something since I was a student. So that was a really, really great return. And then it was Sydney after that. <laughs> and mm. then Adelaide and Queensland again. And now I'm down here starting a very new opera company, Australia's newest opera company, National Opera. Yeah, that, that's, that's very exciting. I definitely want to dive into that a little bit in, in this interview as well. I, I wanted to ask though, uh, it, it's, it always... I must have had some sort of thought in the back of my mind that, you know, a conductor would kind of be uh, changed to one orchestra and they would be working with that orchestra for quite a long time. But then, you know, I, I come to see the concert that you conducted and then I go to see the, the symphony again uh, a few weeks later and it's a different conductor. And I was kind of thinking, how does this process go? You know, what, what's the process? Do you kind of travel around to these various uh, orchestras? Is that, is that the standard practice amongst conductors in the industry? Um, and then how does that go when you're working with the orchestra in order to prepare for the for the concert? Yeah. Each orchestra in, in the world normally will have one sort of titled conductor, like a chief okay. conductor or a resident conductor, or and they might have several principal guest conductor, music director, whatever. There's so many different names. And and a music director or a chief conductor might spend anywhere between eight and and 14 weeks a year with their home orchestra which isn't mm -hmm. very long so then the rest of the season the next 30 weeks or something has to be filled with guest conductors and that's partially a function of of the, the chief conductors being busy and, and also you know their careers happening elsewhere in the world often people might hold two sometimes three chief conductorships mm -hmm. um and so orchestras fill the rest of the season with guest conductors, um, which is what I've been doing in, in Australia. Um, it's guest conducting is a funny thing and it's what most conductors do. Almost all conductors have a freelance career. They go from orchestra to orchestra, but you hope that you develop relationships with orchestras over time, because for me anyway, I think some people thrive off it but going to a new orchestra every week, an unknown orchestra is, is fairly, it gets the adrenaline pumping to mm. walk into a room of people who are mostly older than, than me. Um, and then having to tell them what to do and play music and mm. with their vast collective experience on their instruments and with that music, it can be quite um, stressful, especially mm. when you combine that with long haul flights and new new beds in hotel rooms and all of that. Sometimes a new language. It's that's that's sort of the guest conducting circuit. But I'm lucky mm. here in Australia uh, that I've been able to develop relationships with with our orchestras, especially mm. USO, especially Opera Queensland and and the ASO, and to to re meet orchestras like like the Sydney Symphony and uh, Melbourne Symphony. Hmm. Um, it's, it's not as daunting when you return to, to a group with whom you're familiar. Yeah. Um, and I'll just be interested to see what happens to our industry now, which has been so based around long haul travel. You know, you can do a concert in London one night and be back in Australia rehearsing two days later, which is... Yeah not healthy and not sustainable on so many levels mm -hmm. but it's sort of how this industry started to work in the jet age um, and it wasn't always like that in in the early 20th century and late 19th century music directors of orchestras stayed there almost all the time now, there was still some travel mm -hmm. like famous conductors like Gustav Mahler or Arturo Toscanini they crossed the Atlantic between Europe and, 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 and the United States many times mm. for work, but it wasn't so frequent. Orchestras uh, got to know um, their conductor and the conductor could shape a sound, 
a sound world, a sound philosophy. Mm. Uh, of course, it's very different now. Post pandemic, people are in one place more or less, and I think it's good for it's good for us for a start. The conductor's not having to travel around so much, mm. um, but it's also good for the orchestras and for uh, the, our audiences, which of course are so important to have local people who are really invested in in not just the success and the growth of the orchestra, but who are invested in the arts and culture in, in the wider community because mm. we're from here. And I, I'm not to, it's not to say that a fly in fly out music director from overseas won't have that same investment, but I think local artists, local musicians have a real buy-in to what happens in this country in, in the distant future. Yeah. But I, I, I fully agree with you there. And I think that um, I'm so on board with what you're saying about local arts and local musicians coming back together and people supporting local art. I mean, uh, one thing that uh, 2020 definitely did for me, it, it reinvigorated uh, this understanding within me that there is a serious purpose out there for musicians in society. And even though I got a music degree, I think for a long time, I was kind of in this strange world where I was, uh, you know, in that kind of place where musicians can often go to where it's kind of like, oh, nobody's supporting arts. And, you know, there's not really much of a future in pursuing a career in music. I might as well try these other things. And, and I realized how stupid that was and how irresponsible it was of me to be thinking like that because musicians and the arts play such a crucial role in the development of a culture and a nation. And, I mean, um, you know, even recently, my wife being from America also, um, you know, okay. she had already booked a flight to go over and see her family uh, and then COVID hit. And so she had all this flight credit and we just decided, let's fly to Sydney for the weekend. Let's go see, you know, Hamilton and Frozen and, you know, let's just go see some plays and um, experience the culture of Sydney. And it was, it was just one of the most incredible experiences just going down there and spending this time taking in the culture and, of our country right and and yeah. obviously imported uh, m uh musicals but um you know local uh, uh musicians and singers it was incredible but now i i, I wanted to ask this question um that uh i'm gonna be have i'm gonna have to be careful about how i word this because i'm gonna come off as stupid and ignorant but that's okay um no, <laughs> so um often i think that there there can definitely be the um impression out there that you know conducting is just about waving a stick you know like and and then when i when i came to uh to see the 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 concert i i saw you conducting and i thought man it is so much more than that it is it is that is a skill that would just take years and years to perfect and not only that but then i went to see the symphony a second time and i realized okay so every conductor obviously has their own language, right? As in, you know, everyone has their own style. So I wanted to hear from you, what was the process of training to be a conductor like? Like what, what kind of um, uh, 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 practicing were you engaging in and, and, and what was it like to do that? And on top of that, um, I guess the more important question I wanna ask is that language that you seem to have developed in your conducting style, uh, is that something that kind of came naturally to you? Is that something that you developed by looking at other conductors? How did that kind of come about? Yeah, conducting is a really interesting profession, craft, art form, mm. because it is very intangible in a way because conductors don't make any sounds themselves. Mm. And I get asked all the time, do they, the musicians actually look at you? Um, I would say to train to be a conductor, you, you have to be a musician already. You have to have mm. strong musical ideas and a very solid musical education in all the fundaments. Um, it's interesting because there are, of course, it is a physical act and there is a basic grammar of conducting, like a, how to conduct a 4-4 pattern mm. or a 3-4 pattern, which is more or less similar in the majority of conductors, this basic, these basic beat patterns, these basic indications. But what the communication, the physical communication, the communication through gesture in when the music's going in a concert or in a rehearsal, 
you need to have a vocabulary of gestures that that is comes naturally that that a musician can understand instantaneously without even having to think about it so so you know if you were in the street and someone came up like this and held their hand in your face you would instantly know what that meant without having to think about that and mm. so there are all kinds of ways of moving your hands through the air with more resistance suggests a thicker more lugubrious richer sound mm. uh, more pointed and sprightly movements reflects you know music that is short and detached and light um but all of this come it, at least for me i found it it came pretty naturally at the beginning this sort of um being able to embody sound, how you want something to sound. And that's a whole other can of worms. You can have the greatest conducting technique, be super clear, be able to conduct complex music and time changes and whatever, and show whatever sound you want. But if you don't have the idea, if you do not have the piece conceived in your head, then, then it doesn't mean anything because hmm. orchestras want to know how you want them to play. They've played some of these pieces so many times. Some of them they haven't, but our orchestras in general are, are, are excellent and they don't really need a conductor to play together a lot of the time. Hmm. But they need to know how, how loud is loud? What kind of loud is it? How slow is slow? How fast is fast? How long do you want these notes? What instrument do we need to bring out more of? And so the majority of the work for a conductor is done at a desk alone, looking at the music, knowing that composer, knowing the style, knowing what was going on in the composer's life at the time, what he or she wanted from the music, what he or she was going for, if it's an opera, what the text means, spotting any, working out how the, how the harmonic and the big structures work so you know how to pace the work, where you need to move in and out of, places it's it's a lot of it's a lot of, of very solitary study so that's that's mm. the real base of the pyramid this, this this musical conception that's very clear in your head and you have this ideal picture in your head of how you want the music to sound so that's the first step and then you go to rehearsal which is is the next pretty big chunk of the pyramid mm. and in the rehearsal you you, you start to conduct the orchestra and you constantly are comparing the ideal picture you have this inner hearing this this whole sound world you have in your head with what you are hearing in reality and and because time is money if you can change a sound change an articulation change a volume or a dynamic with a gesture it saves so much time because there's never enough rehearsal time really and mm. so it, it's the, the rehearsal is about reconciling what you have in your head based on all your study and knowledge of the composer and the historical context of the piece and and what the orchestra is playing and of course it's a it's a situation where you don't always have the best ideas as a conductor sometimes a player will come out with something and it's not what you thought of but it's better it's more convincing it's more moving and, and that's all part of that rehearsal room, this, this exercise in leadership, in mass psychology, group psychology, to, to, to inspire people, to give of their best, to play beautifully, to, to strive towards a common goal, all heading in the same direction. And then the tip of the pyramid is the performance. And I mm. often liken it, the role of a conductor to something like a sports coach except that a conductor can make a difference in the game. Mm. You can be spontaneous. You can take something a little bit faster. Yeah. You can linger over a phrase. You can bring out a part that you've never really brought out before. You can hold a silence for longer because you're affecting things through this, this vocabulary of physical gesture. Mm. Yeah, man, that's so fascinating. I, I, I love this. And are you thinking about the audience at all while you're conducting? Is there an element of performance there that you're putting on? You know, you're 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 conducting obviously this energy to the to the orchestra, but are you thinking about the people behind you as well, or is it just all you and the orchestra? Yeah, it's funny you should mention energy. Um, 
the word conductor, as far as I know amongst languages for our profession, in English, conducting is 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 a unique name because you know in a lot of the 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 Romance languages, German, whatever you know, as well, it's you know direttore in Italian, and director in Spanish, dirigent German, French is chef d'orchestre, the boss of the orchestra. <laughs> um, ch Chinese is zhuhuijia, which is like a commander, mm. but in in English, it's conductor, which suggests the moving of energy. And I do believe it's this, this sort of, this energy from within the conductor, uh, harnessing and directing energies from the orchestra, from the composer. And, and we feel it when there's an audience who's really invested in what we're doing. It, it, mm. It's amazing how palpable it is. And it helps us to rise to the occasion. So it is this exchange of, of energies going all kinds of different ways. Yeah, yeah. It's it's quite amazing that that was certainly my experience was that that the the music was incredible and the emotion I was feeling as a result of hearing that music was was amazing as well. But uh, your role in allowing us to experience that emotion was was clear to me. It was clear that you were playing a a vital role in this the scene of this concert because you know I you know I look up. And here's this conductor. You know, you're you're putting your entire body into this into this uh, you know into in, into this performance, and and it was amazing to me. I just thought, you know, th there's something going on here that's so important, and I, it it's becoming a, a little bit clearer to me. It's almost as if, you know, so obviously music is so much about emotion and feeling, and 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 that's what it's supposed to bring up within us. It's almost as if your role is to, uh, you know, perfectly embody the emotion of that piece and to understand it as purely as you can, and then to find a way with your hands and you know your body to get the the orchestra to follow that emotion that you see in the piece. But it, it's also it it seems like it's a, you know, what's the role of what's the role of the conductor compared to the role of the orchestra in is it all follow the the, the conductor or is it um i guess that's a silly question we've already kind of discussed oh, it's that not at all actually i i think um it's not it's it's not sort of like you put a downbeat and say play slaves and they have to do exactly exactly what you want hmm. um it's not like driving even though the orchestra is a very good it's not like driving a ferrari it's like it's like riding a beautiful purebred stallion. It, it it has a orchestras have a life of their own, mm. and orchestras don't need. You know, conductor can screw up an orchestra, can screw up a performance. Mm. Um, if they do, if 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 they're giving off a bad energy, or they're not clear, or they push the orchestra to do something that is unnatural. Um, one of the the greatest lessons I actually learned was when I was when I was first when I was a student. I was eighteen and um, was doing a master class with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra and uh, Maestro Gelmetti, who was my teacher at the time. And I got up to conduct the second movement of the Beethoven Seventh Symphony, which I actually did in the concert you saw, mm -hmm. and had so many ideas and it's such a moving piece of music and it's been in so many movies and um it's so i was trying to show everything control everything and my short job he just got up he made me stop stood next to me on the podium he started that first wing chord brought in the cellos and the violas and the basses and then just left it and and this music this incredible music that it stood through centuries, just grew and took shape, totally without a conductor. But that mm. was a really important lesson. He he always said, never disturb, just create. It's mm. it's a balance that is there's always that I'm always striving to attain. And it's a difficult balance to reach. Yeah. But you have to know when the orchestra needs you or when something needs to change. And when they can play without you, when they when when you can just ride that wave of this amazing orchestra and that collective experience, because it's that is that's that's as good as it gets. 
And so that's why listening is so important. Listening and knowing. And you always have to have your, your mind in the past to remember things, mistakes, things that could have gone better. You have to have your mind in the present to, to create in the moment. And of course, your mind in the future, because everything we do when we conduct is a slight anticipation of mm. what is about to come. Because if we do it in the moment, then it's too late. People can't follow that. So, so it is really being very aware of what's unfolding in the orchestra when they need mm. you and when you just need to get out of the way and just let them play beautifully. Yeah, man, that's amazing. It must must be a. It, I, I just can't imagine the pressure, you know, that must be on uh, when 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 you're conducting an orchestra. And I guess you may have just answered it then, but it, you know, I'm a I'm a jazz musician, so I'm very familiar with the feeling of being with a band and getting into that kind of flow state where you're not thinking about anything. It's just all going in that you're all moving towards that same direction. Yeah. And that's one of the greatest feelings I ever experienced in life, right? But I wonder, do you, I, I know you kind of so carefully embody the, the, the musical piece so that it's, it's a part of you almost and, 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 and you don't have to think so much about the details because they're so much a part of you know, the study that you've done. But do you ever find yourself getting into that flow state where you and the orchestra are moving, you know, simultaneously towards that goal? Or do you find that it's such an intellectual pursuit, this conducting that you constantly have to be in, in the thinking mode? It's one of my teachers used to say, you have to have a cool head and a warm heart. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's a bit of both, but by the performance, hopefully most of the work's been done. Yeah. And if I've really absorbed the work and the orchestra has absorbed the work, then we can be spontaneous. Then we can get into this, this flow state, into this zone. It doesn't happen that often and it happens less and less the more experienced I get, I think just because mm. my standards are higher. But um, it is a wonderful, wonderful thing when it does happen. And, and we always, yeah. all, all, that's why I think everybody becomes a musician. To, because they've experienced that before and we, we want to recreate that we want mm. to recreate this, this flow state and it happens it happens and that's what rehearsals are for to try to get us to the point where we can do that but mm. it's elusive and special and doesn't happen all the time but i think everybody in the room knows when something really special is is, is happening in a performance mm. absolutely and going back to your point about conducting it's almost as if you know, I think even if you don't have the opportunity in life to become a musician, you can still engage in that same process because, I mean, while you're sitting there in the audience and you've got the conductor here and the orchestra on the other side, there is a transfer of that experience, right? It, it's, it's like the moment when somebody does a, a solo that is just so mind boggling, you can't even imagine how they could possibly do that. And you're right there with them in that moment you know, fearing for their artistic brilliance, you know, because it's just, it's, it's happening right before you. And, and I think that people, even though they might not get the experience of the musician, they can still be brought into that experience, which is what music does. It brings us into that strange world. Uh, we don't quite know how to describe it, but it's, it's a strange world where you are just in that perfect unity, you know, and you're moving in that direction that is just, um, it's it's a it's it's a strange world, isn't it? We're we're such strange creatures. Um, what we are capable of, and I think the symphony does a good job of showing that just how brilliant we can be as a human race, right? Yeah, it is a completely human experience, really. And I I think the symphony orchestra is one of the great inventions of of human civilization, really. Mm. It's just this most incredible living organism, and sitting in a concert hall and feeling that that the physical waves of sound wash over you from real other humans and sitting next to other humans is something that you just can't replicate with live streams or, or, or CDs or, yeah. or whatever. It, I think this past year has really brought that home to so many people that mm. there is something that is innately human about live performance. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, th I think we're rediscovering that. I think that we've, um, uh, we're heading on a, a good path it seems to me at least where people are reawakening you know to 
a, a deeper view of culture and what it actually means and, and how symbolic it is and how, how rich in meaning it is. Um, I wanted to ask you, what, what do you think is your, your most cherished experience that you've had in your career? You know, the best performance or the best teaching moment. I know you gave me a great teaching moment earlier, but yeah, what's been the best moment for you? Yeah, it's, it's so hard to pin things down, really. Um, I mean, my my proper adult debut at the Sydney Opera House, conducting La Boheme, was pretty special with Opera Australia. Wow. That was great. That was wonderful. Um, and actually, there was a funny concert with the QSO at the end of 2019, where I was going as an audience member and their conductor fell ill and I had to step in with an hour's notice. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Music I knew already, luckily, and an orchestra that I knew. Uh, mm. And so it sort of takes the pressure off in a strange way mm. because you hadn't rehearsed. You didn't even know you were conducting a concert uh, yeah. an hour before. Um, Did you and, find that you and, could just kind of let go and, and deal with what was in front of you just because there was so little preparation? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And um, it was quite an exhilarating experience, actually. Mm, yeah, I can imagine the adrenaline would have been insane. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, yeah, I, I guess um, I, I really want to dive into this, uh, this Australian opera that, that, um, that, that you're putting to, or national opera that you're putting together. National opera, yeah. um, firstly, tell me, let's say I'm a lay person, which I am. <laughs> <laughs> um tell me tell me what it is that opera still brings to our culture and why it's necessary to preserve such a such an art. I, I think it's 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 stunning it's beautiful and we should preserve it but how do you explain that to people that we need to keep this about i think opera deals in in experiences and emotions and situations that are universal that are things that we all experience in life with love and hate jealousy loss humor mm. and it does it in is such a really visceral way because it's the human voice unamplified that has been trained to to sing over an orchestra into a huge auditorium and and a voice is something that all of us have whether we say we can sing or not but we can all relate to the experience of making a sound making of making our voices heard and and opera is, is sort of the elevation of all that these these very true human experiences being portrayed by other humans singing mm. with their, their voices it operas the in, in a way, a culmination of so many art forms. That's why it's so difficult to put, put together and so expensive to put mm. together because you've got singing, you have an orchestra, you've got music, you have poetry and text uh, and writing and prose. You've got design, architecture, costume design, set design, lighting, uh, and the list goes on and on and on so it's a huge collaborative endeavor even more mm. so than just an orchestra alone and and it 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 deals when, when opera gets it right it deals in real human emotions and real human truth presented in a way that that just speaks to people speaks um, very immediately to mm. our emotions to our spirits in a way that in my experience, very little else does. Yeah, yeah. Now you use the word uh, our spirits there. So I'm, I'm going to uh, latch on to that for selfish reasons. Cause there was a question that I, I kind of considered diving into earlier that uh, I thought might not come off right, but I've often thought that what's happening in, you know, you could even say in an opera, I have never seen an opera but let's let's stick with the symphony then you know you've got these layers built upon layers of virtue like you just mentioned there you know it's you've got 
poetry you've got the singing you've got you know the orchestra you've got the the venue like there's so many things that had to happen for this one song or this one line to just go perfectly it's insane that we as humans could could figure this out and get to a stage where we can create something like this uh but it seems to me like what what's happening when the musicians, uh, you know, are in in kind of that flow state with the audience. It's almost as if there's like the creation of a soul that encapsulates all who are experienced this, right? And and everybody's in that same state, that same space, experiencing that together. And there's something strange that happens in a performance, don't you think? When uh, you you could say that something flows through the spirit of all who are experiencing it, whether they're performing or they're listening, that brings them all together. It's kind of a strange phenomenon, right? Well, that's right. And, and I think where opera differs from symphonic music is, is that symphonic is, is sort of abstract mostly. You know, there might be a, a story or a program behind it, but Opera is, is real situations are happening in stage. It's not abstract at all. It's very concrete. So you experience, mm. you experience, anyone who's experienced losing somebody they love and they watch Mimi die in Rodolfo's arms in La Boheme. I mean, there are tears all over the auditorium when that happens because we've mm. bought into these characters. We've bought into their love story. And, and it's the voice in the orchestra that, that conveys that. Mm. Um, and, and so when, 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 you know, a beloved character dies, I think it, it brings us into this collective experience of, of what loss means. And, and it, you know, while loss is painful, I, I think there is something consoling about opera, consoling about music by experiencing mm. these emotions with other people. And it's something that I don't believe that in our modern day culture, we're really encouraged to embrace these deep emotions everything is quite surface level normally mm. everything is digested in sound bites things happen things happen quickly pop songs go for what four minutes there's so many studies on our attention spans that, that are diminishing mm. uh you know with the iphone generation and there's something about sitting through something that encourages us to be still for a time and to 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 experience and to feel our feelings to feel our emotions that we don't get many chances to do in mm. the world in the modern day yeah. well it can almost be like a religious ritual right i mean like you you put on a suit you know, you might go out to dinner beforehand, you know, you go into this beautiful theater and everything is perfect. Everything is perfect in the performance. And it's, it's, it's like we're rehearsing what life could be like if we truly engaged with, with everything that we could engage with in life. Right. Um, That's right. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think, um, I had an experience recently, we went down to Sydney, as I said, and we went to the, the national art gallery down there and, um, looking at some of the Renaissance art that they had in there and, you know, you stand there and I had these experiences where I'd look, be looking at this painting and like opera, you know, you're describing that you, you're drawn in to the emotion of the piece and, you know, tears were coming up within me because, because I was so, it, it, it so perfectly conveyed that emotion and I can really, um, uh, yeah, I really follow what you're saying in terms of like, what else do you think we're missing in our modern culture that, that is encapsulated in experiences like the opera or, you know, um, ancient art and things like that? What, and, and how do you think we regain that? Because not everybody's going to think, well, I'm not getting this from pop music, so I might as well go to the opera, you know, like, what, what can we do to, um, I guess, regain that that meaning within the art that we create and that might be a question coming from the artist side of me you know how can I do that with my music yeah it's 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 a difficult thing isn't it I I, I don't even know, pretend to know the answer for how mm. we well, I think it's about spending time and concentrating and and there's definitely a move towards it now and mm. I think sort of reaction against this this four minute sound bites or these politicians sound bites rather than actually going in, you know, it's everywhere. Politicians have their stock answers for every question they're asked. 
They mm. rarely go into detail and they rarely <laughs> engage in any meaningful kind of conversation and dialogue yeah. uh, that's not scripted or pre-planned. Um, but there's a movement against that, you know, with this whole mindfulness thing that that's having a, a huge resurgence. Um, I just think any really good art, whether it's opera, whether it's symphony, whether it's visual arts or, or, or in novels or in poetry, or, I mean, the list is endless, but I think this is the role of culture in our lives and to re-engage with, with culture that, that, that perhaps is being created today, perhaps is being created 500 years ago, but it all hits home that, that our experiences, our basic experiences as humans, Mm. aren't very different from what they were 500 a thousand years ago yeah yeah i, so I, I definitely engage with that? Yeah. i don't know i think it's just it is about seeking out cultural experiences human experiences these sort of transformative experiences yeah i think i, I think uh, i agree with everything you're saying and, and on top of that i think that what art does for us is it it makes you realize that maybe you didn't even know who you were, you know, maybe, maybe you didn't realize the depth of, of your own being, you know, because there's, there's such in art, there's such a vast, uh, you know, array of, of experiences, in, you know, put into painting or into music and all this sort of stuff. And it, um, yeah, it, it, it just teaches you that you, although there are, the, there are those common experiences among all human beings, Maybe there's some things that you don't see that maybe you could see if you looked deeper. You know, I think that that's something that um, always tends to surprise me. I wanted to ask, uh, I guess, what do you hope for the National Opera? You know, what are your goals with it? Um, where would you like to see it go? You know, I think it's really a really exciting new company. Um, it was founded by a great friend and colleague of mine, Peter Coleman Wright, who is one of Australia's greatest opera singers and we worked together in London and we talked about how great it would be to start up a company in Australia mm. and and the National Opera emerged and um, it's very exciting because it is employing all these amazing Australian artists and a, one of the the silver linings of this COVID pandemic has been the number of great Australian artists, musicians, singers have come back home and so we just we have an absolutely world-class cast and Canberra's never had a professional opera company before that's been resident in Canberra uh, and it's our national capital so it's a great chance to develop the art form in Australia to be able to develop new talent and new composers and to sort of shepherd them through this 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 company as a way of reinvesting in opera in this country mm. and, and bringing it to new people and, and creating a new generation as well as supporting all this fantastic Australian talent that has often had to, to go overseas. I mean, like I did, there wasn't enough work in Australia. And mm. so I, like so many others, went overseas to, to pursue our careers. So this is just a step towards bringing more Australians, fantastic mm. Australian artists back home. Yeah, I love it. It's, it's great work that you're doing. And I guess all I can say is that um, for anybody who's listening to this, I'm going to put links to your website uh, in, in the show notes. And I just, I genuinely really hope that anybody listening to this sometime in their life has an opportunity to see you conducting and to go and see a show that you're at because um it was it was inspiring to me it really made me uh, uh want to be a better artist in general and uh and thank you so much for coming on the show it's been great to talk to you dane it's my pleasure simon thank you very much <laughs> Hey there, YouTubers. I just wanted to let you know that if you love this episode and you'd like many more just like it, then you can head to patreon.com forward slash Simon J.E. Drew. There you'll get access to exclusive episodes that haven't been released yet, as well as many other benefits. Also, if you'd like to work one-on-one -on -one with me in my coaching practice, then you can head to simonjedrew.com forward slash coaching. Talk to you soon.